Welcome to part four of our series, With God, a series devoted to helping us read the Bible for personal transformation. This is, of course, part four. Thus, there are three parts before. If you have not watched parts one through three, please go ahead and do that right now. Come back to this video later. This series is inspired heavily by, inspired by and drawing heavily on the book Life with God by Richard Foster, and I highly recommend picking this book up. It is a wonderful resource and has changed my life greatly. So let's just dive right in. So this, in these next few videos, we're going to be talking about cultivating the intention to read reading the Bible for transformation. Uh, and Foster gives a great quote from William Law about intention, um, cultivating this intentionality to do this. Uh, William Law says, It was this intention that made the primitive Christians such eminent instances, instances of piety, that made the goodly fellowship of the saints and all the glorious army of martyrs and confessors. And if you will here stop and ask yourself why you are not as pious as the primitive Christians were, your own heart will tell you that it is neither through ignorance or inability, but purely because you never thoroughly intended it. I don't know about you, but that hits me right where I live. There are so many things in my life that I started but failed at because I never really intended to accomplish them. And the same goes with the spiritual life, with the life with God. We need to, need to cultivate this intentionality and simply just want to do it. So we're talking about reading the Bible to get deep into the Bible today. Get deep into the Bible so that we can experience the God who gave us the Bible, so that we can know God. We're not talking about reading for information, but to experience God and be transformed by God. And the difference between reading the Bible for surface level information and reading the Bible for a real experience of God can be seen really in the biblical example that Foster gives of John's account of the resurrection of Jesus Christ on the morning, well, on the morning that he was resurrected, out, standing outside the tomb that was empty. And then there we see three people. We see uh, first Mary Magdalene, and then later the disciples Peter and John show up. Peter and John, they, they see the empty tomb, and they get the information of, this, of the setting, and they say, okay, Jesus is resurrected. Grave clothes are there. Uh, tomb is empty. Okay, he's resurrected, and they accept it and go on. Mary, yearning for experience of Jesus, stays, and she's crying. She's distraught over this, and then Jesus himself comes to her. She can't recognize him at first, but then he, he, he interacts with her. He, he calls her name. He sees her, and then she recognizes him, and, and she realizes that God is here. Jesus is, is, is encountering her. She has this experience of God, whereas Peter and John, they only have information. Mary had her eyes opened by Jesus, whereas Peter and John only saw with human eyes the mere facts of the situation. And when we read the Bible on just the, the surface level, it's like we, have the we are mentally registering the words of the text without recognizing who it is that is speaking through that text. We must allow the Holy Spirit to guide us to recognize God's voice in the Bible. And that's how we start to read the Bible with the heart inviting the Holy Spirit to guide us. Whenever we sit down to read, be it a little bit of the Bible or a whole lot, maybe a whole book, we prepare by prayerfully inviting the Spirit to guide our reading, to reveal to us the words that God is speaking to us through the text. And please avoid like the plague books and articles and reading plans that are like geared toward certain demographics or certain kinds of people or, or, or certain situations. I've seen these things assembled as, you know, Bible passages for people struggling with faith, and Bible passages for men, and Bible passages for women, and Bible passages for teens, for, for couples, for single people, for air traffic controllers. Okay, I made that last one up. But reading the Bible in this way is so harmful to our walk with God because, as I have said in a previous video, in these, message, message, in these methods of reading, we are dictating to the Bible what we want it to say to us. Not allowing God to speak what God wants to say through the text. And I don't... Uh, oh, excuse me. This happens a lot more often than we really realize. Um, 
We want a just tell me what to do life of faith. So we treat the Bible as more like an owner's manual. And I don't know about you, but the only time that I consult an owner's manual for anything that I buy is when something's going wrong. And that's not what the Bible is intended for. No, it's not supposed to fix us. It is supposed to form us. And that's why reading the Bible with the heart is just so important. Because so many of us read the Bible like an owner's manual or looking to be just told what to do. It has produced so many Christians that are what I call religious but not spiritual. Meaning they, 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 they do all kinds of religious things. They may be in church every single Sunday. They may, they may help out with the Bible study. They may, they may uh, do, do mission trips. They, they serve on committees, but they're missing the relationship with Jesus Christ. They're never actually engaging with that depth of the Spirit of God and are thus just doing the rites and the rituals. Case in, they never really become transformed. You know, another group of people that did this historically were the Pharisees. They were so concerned with, with doing the religious things that they missed the relationship with God entirely. And that did not work out very well because if you remember, they ended up killing the Son of God. That's not who we're supposed to emulate. That's not a biblical faction that we are supposed to emulate. That's who we're trying not to be. So we need to cultivate that life with God. And that's a lot more than just doing religious things. And a great way to read with the heart so that we can actually become spiritual and led by God and live the life with God is through an ancient practice called Lectio Divina. The practice is a practice that Foster recommends. And this entails reading a short passage of scripture. We're not trying to get a whole book in this, in this uh, reading. We're just trying to focus on one scene, one story, one narrative. Let's, let's for example, use the, uh, the example that I gave earlier about Mary and, and Jesus outside the tomb. Take this one passage of scripture and read it in a specific way that allows the mind to metaphorically descend into the heart so that our whole consciousness can be drawn and immersed in the love and the goodness of God. The goal here is to experience God as God is at work in that passage. And there are four elements to Lectio Divina. Listening, reflecting, praying, and obeying. We listen with a listening spirit. We reflect on what we are hearing from the text. We pray in response to that hearing, and we contemplate what we will carry forward into our lives. And done together, they, they kind of overlap and they circle back on each other throughout the whole experience. Now, you can find more detailed instructions on Lectio Divina on the internet somewhere, so I won't take up a whole bunch of time with this right here. But start by selecting the passage of Scripture that you're going to, going to read. Um, you could just be it could just be one that you're drawn to, um, though I found that, that the trap in that is that you, I default back to the same ones over and over. Um, or you could uh, find a reading plan, such as the Revised Common Lectionary's Daily Reading Plan. Um, I'll link that down below and up in the card that should be appearing right here right now. Um, so for, first select your passage, then get a pad and a pencil or a pen to take notes on. So anything, you know, you can remember to actually take forward into your life from then on. And then you got to find a quiet place to read where you won't be disturbed for, let's say, I don't know, 10 minutes or however long it takes you to do this. Now, if there's no quiet place in your house, you might need to get creative. Um, you can go to a park um, when they're open. You can go to a coffee shop. I know that's not uh, possible at the time this video is uploaded because we're still in the coronavirus pandemic and we kind of don't want to, you know, catch anything. Um, but if nothing else, Go, go park your car in the corner of, a, of, a, of an empty parking lot for a bit. Um, wherever you can find a little bit of time uh, to read undisturbed. Then take a good solid minute, 60 seconds, in silence, and pray for the Spirit to be present with you. It will feel awkward at first, but you will be amazed at how you feel after doing this. Once you've prayed, get yourself into a mindset of expecting God to be at work and be listening for what God is doing as you read. Then read the passage through once. Don't hurry through it, don't take forever. 
Just read through it at a comfortable pace, paying attention, listening to God, focusing on God, just taking in what God is giving you in this passage. And then read that again. Read the passage again, but this time slower. And highlight or underline words or phrases that just kind of grab your attention, that kind of float out to you. Because that's God speaking to you saying, okay, I'm talking to you in this thing. This is going to be important to what I'm saying to you. Now, don't evaluate what you're doing. Don't worry about doing it wrong. Just trust in God and take in what God's given you. Lean into the Spirit and trust in God. And then comes reflecting. This involves, well, um, reflecting on what you've been reading. And, but it's, it's reflecting in a way that puts you in the scene itself so that you can get a sense of the experience of God in the midst of that scene. Let's take the scene of Mary and, and Jesus again. Put yourself in Mary's shoes. Notice things about the setting. What does the, the lighting look like? Is the sun coming up? Is it a sunny day or are there clouds? Is, is, the, is the light coming directly down on the scene or is it filtered through trees? What is the air, what is the air like? Is it cool? Is it warm? Humid? Dry? Maybe there's a breeze blowing. Do you smell flowers or the plants around? What do you feel when you hear the sound of Jesus calling your name? How can you describe the feeling that you're having when you realize the man standing in front of you is Jesus? And as, you, as your mind works through the details, noticing things in the scene, you will become alert to what, con what connections that the Spirit is making between what's happening in the scene and, and your life. You become alert to what's happening. And all the while, you should be asking, God, what are you revealing to me? How are you revealing yourself to me now? Then you can move on to the third element, praying. And simply put, that's just turning to God and, and, and speaking to, to God. God is speaking to us and we speak to God and it's just this, this, this conversation, this continual conversation. It's just resting deeply in the current of prayer in this time spent with God. And then the fourth element, obeying. Ask God in this time for the wisdom to carry this gift of life with God into the regular flow of your life. Maybe, you know, how to take this experience right now and use it to transform our life. Maybe after experiencing how Jesus saw Mary, we are moved to notice people that people might, that everyone else might be ignoring. To notice people that might get overlooked by everyone. Maybe it's um, a guy on the street that looks like he might be lonely. Or maybe it's, maybe it's the kid in the class that always seems really quiet. Or the person who's not speaking up at a meeting. Reach out. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's reaching out to, to know the, so they can know the dignity of being seen. And the, the joy of having a connection with someone. One might be so filled with love that we're moved to go and show love to a loved one. You know, hey, you know, I haven't, uh, haven't called grandma in a long time. Maybe I'll call her up. Maybe I'll drop a line to an old friend. You know, our time spent with God in this way challenges our perspective. It changes how we look at things to see what really matters in life. And it moves us to attend to those things instead of being distracted by those things that aren't really important. You know, they, they, they try and convince us they're important, but they're really not. And these four things can go round and round and round and round. It's not just a, you start at one, you end at four. You can find yourself going and reading it again, even after you've gone to the obeying scene or just popping into different phases as you're doing this. Don't be surprised if you find this difficult or weird the first few times you do it, because that, that's what happens when you're doing things that you're not familiar with or have been exposed to in the past. That's all for today. Tune in tomorrow as we will continue with our uh, reading the Bible for transformation. Have a great day, folks.